Do you want to know how you can build an audience as a digital writer? If the answer is yes, then I'm happy that you tune in today because this is exactly what we are going to see today. Today I have a special guest, but before that, welcome to Build Your Thing, the podcast where we help content creators find their unique creative voice, monetize their work, and build their tribe of loyal fans. I'm your host, Matt Giaro, and I'm happy to have you here. Today, as I mentioned, I have a special guest. His name is John Brosio, and he has a really interesting story. And he went from waiter to creator. And he has very and a very interesting approach in how he actually grows his Twitter account. He also achieved like 20,000 followers on Medium. So this guy actually knows what he's talking about. So I can't wait to share this great call with you. And with that being said, let's jump into it. All right, John, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Matt. Super excited. Yeah, I mean, it's a pleasure to have you here. And before I click the record button, uh, we just had a, a little chit chat about your crazy Twitter growth. And I don't want to spoil the episode here because we are going to talk about that. But for the time being, could you please introduce yourself and just tell us who you are and what you're actually doing? Yeah, so I'll give you a little bit of um, kind of my genesis story is what I call it. And I think a lot of other creators call it. Um, and that'll bring us to kind of how I find myself today. So back in 2017, I was working at a restaurant for almost 10 years. I worked as a fine dining server and um, I had just moved to LA from Boston and I was working at this place that was kind of shady. Um, and long story short, the place caught fire one night, January 19th, 2017, and, um, when I woke up, I woke up to a bunch of text messages, missed phone calls telling me that the place caught fire. So what I, what happened was I found myself out of a job for the first time in my life, having to go on unemployment. And I was in this place mentally, um, where I was obviously staying up late. I was drinking, I was actually smoking cigarettes back then. Um, I was just living kind of like an unhealthy life and that, same morning, I decided to myself, you know what? Like I have all the time in the world. Things are really confusing right now. I'm going to commit myself to writing for 30 days. And what I did was I didn't know what I was doing. So I bought um, a domain and hosting on Wix and I just started writing. I wasn't sharing it with anyone. I just started writing. 30 days quickly turned into like 60 plus. And um, you know, when you're working on a project, kind of blind spots are revealed to you. And I had uh, these blind spots revealed to me in the form of Quora.com first and Medium second. And I saw this opportunity to write in a similar way that I was writing, but actually have people see what I was writing and publishing. And it was refreshing to me to know that I had anonymity. Um, and what I mean by that is if I were to publish my stuff on like my Instagram feed or my Facebook feed at the time, it was kind of, I had this sense of imposter syndrome and that, um, like who, why is John publishing this stuff? Like he's not a writer. He didn't go to school for writing. And so I was really afraid to publish my thoughts and ideas and articles. And so I started publishing on, um, Quora first and very quickly in about three months, I generated over a million views of content. Um, and this was still early 2017. And like I was saying, the more you kind of do something, the more clues you see, the more things kind of show themselves in their blind spots. I came across Medium and Medium was kind of the same way. I started publishing on this platform that I had never heard of. And very quickly, I started to grow um, publishing my content. Um, that allowed me, uh, so I was still side hustling. I ended up getting a job again and uh, working in restaurants. And I was side hustling um, on Medium and Quora and just through word of mouth, like people in my own network started to hear about what I was doing. And this helped me secure some of my first freelance jobs. I was ghostwriting for a CEO in San Diego. Um, and I was ghostwriting for a, an internet-based company. Um, and these were all just jobs that came to me. And I thought, okay, well, there's something to this writing. Um, so I'm still side hustling. And then COVID hit and I had lost my job. 
um, again. And this was kind of like the big wake up call where it's like, okay, I have these systems in place. I have the success that I'm experiencing. I'm going to, cause I was kind of hiding behind the side hustling. Um, um, but there was no choice now, you know, the, the restaurant industry got completely destroyed and, and I've been full time ever since. And, um, mostly doing freelancing medium. I don't do too much Quora anymore. Um, just for mainly strategy reasons. Um, but this year, my main goal was to start expanding on different platforms. So on January 1st, I chose LinkedIn and Twitter and was just kind of alike. I think a lot of uh, online content creators will resonate with this. Um, it was really just testing. Knowing what I know about digital writing, I was producing content on these platforms, seeing what would work, what wouldn't work. And I started to grow way faster on Twitter. And then kind of my my formula just becomes like, okay, how much bandwidth do you have in the day? I didn't want to stretch myself too thin and do LinkedIn and Twitter. So uh, 2022 now has been Twitter kind of full steam ahead and building my audience there in a few short months. Um, I've uh, generated about 2,500 followers now. Just last night, I had a piece of content, a thread, uh, do very well, and it's about um, at 700,000 views. So um, I'm really liking the feedback that I'm seeing on Twitter. And um, yeah, that's that's kind of where we are today. Now, there's a lot of details in between that story that we can dive into, but um, that's where we find ourselves today. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. So um, can you walk us a little bit through um, what happened in the first 60 days, right? So you told like, you were like, about what did you write? So how did the actually, how did you came to the idea to actually start writing? Why writing? Why not, you know, um, starting something else online? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, um, when I was living in Boston, I'm originally from Chicago, but I lived in Boston for about four years. Um, I, and I was still working in, well, I was working for a website at one point um, at like a post startup uh, dot com based company and I got fired. Um, <laughs> but uh, we won't go into that. And uh, that's what got me into restaurants. I was doing improv comedy um, and I just fell in love with like comedy writing and um, screenplay writing. And I have some unfinished screenplays. And so I've always kind of been like just geared towards the idea of writing. Um, a lot of the writing after the fire was therapeutic for me. And it really, I'd always been interested in self-help and self-improvement, but um, since I was at this place in my life where things were very confusing, I decided to really explore self-help. And it was kind of, again, cathartic and therapeutic for me to write about how I was feeling with these changes, things that were going on in my head. And when I jumped on to um, Quora, I really kind of just dove into the entire self-improvement community that was living on that platform. And so for anyone listening who isn't familiar with Quora, it's a question answer based platform. So people were asking these questions um, about how to improve in various ways in their life, how to deal with difficult thoughts. And I was answering these question, questions either from expertise that I learned um, throughout all the reading that I'd been doing or expertise that I had gained through personal experience. And one question in particular, um, it was about advice. And I don't remember the exact question, um, but it was kind of like, what advice do you wish you had learned earlier or something like that? And I shared a story about when I was moving um, to Boston and I drove out there with my father and he shared with me a piece of advice about life um, about thinking about life and approaching life. And I shared that story um, just as an answer on Quora. And in less than 24 hours, it popped off for 300,000 views. And I thought, okay, well, you know, you, you listen to feedback in your environment with whatever it is, if it's your full-time job, if it's your relationship, if it's a side hustle. And I was listening to that feedback of, okay, this story resonates. Well, I'm really into like puzzles. Um, and that's why I think I love the online world so much is it's like seeing patterns, it's recognizing patterns, it's 
reverse engineering um, why things work and why they don't, I became obsessed of like, why did this answer resonate with people? Um, and that brought me into learning about copywriting and all these things. So I guess to answer your question, I've always had an interest in writing and then seeing external cues from the environment in which I was operating in said, okay, this is working, follow it. And I just kept following it now for about five years. This is very interesting. And especially that you just started with, um, you know, with an interest that you had. And, you know, many people who start online, um, you know, they just start with, you know, I know what to sell. Uh, so let me just try to reverse engineer it. And the interesting thing here is that as a quote unquote complete newbie, what you just done is like you followed um, the things you were interested in. Um, you just start helping people. And then you just saw that, well, there were some things that resonated more than than um, uh, than than others with the uh, with people, and then you just took it from there. Yeah, and I think, um, and it's hard because it's you know when you uh, when someone says don't think about a red button pushing a red button, what do you do? You think about pushing a red button. But I think from my own personal experience, again, um, what was a gift for me throughout this whole experience was when I was writing, like the initial first year, first months of writing, it was play, right? Like I was writing what I thought was interesting, what was true to me. And that led, that provided clues as to where to go. And I like, so I, I do coaching and I notice a lot of people that try to, instead of like starting with play and then following the clues they think they have the answer and it's more like shoving a square peg into a round hole. Like you're trying to make something work that maybe a market isn't looking for, or maybe an audience isn't looking for, um, because there's so much content out there that says, okay, this is your cookie cutter framework of how to make X, Y, and Z happen. Um, now, if you know the strategy of of how to instill play um, and maybe the side hustle framework into people, I think you have a you know a hundred million dollar idea because um, it's a way that kind of promotes authenticity. It creates a category that's kind of like a hot um, marketing term um, instead of being like, oh, I'm the better self improvement author. I'm the faster you know uh, copywriter. Um, you're creating a category unto yourself. It, it, it kind of leads through that path. I haven't reverse engineered that. <laughs> that to me is a, a bigger puzzle to solve. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think it was, you know, I know it's cliche to say, but it was a lot of luck, my situation to be like, okay, follow the interest first and then look at the clues unbiased and at face value rather than I know what my plan is. Now let me figure out a way to make it work. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, that, 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 that's so true. And, you know, like I see it all, all the times, like you just start, like you think that, well, you have all the answers and then, well, it's like, you just go to market and you, you just see that, well, why is that say my product not selling? Why am I not getting enough traction on it? So sometimes it's not, the problem is not like, um, you, maybe your framework is great, but the thing is that you just didn't do the things in, in the right order. So I, I think a lot of people struggle with, um, you know, making abstraction um, and really trying just to um, to make like it work as soon as possible, right? So they start, let's say, um, you know, they create their social media accounts, uh, whatever platform. Um, and then, well, they just think that, well, I'm going to earn money from from my five, my first article or from my first tweet. So um, I wanted to um, actually pick your brain a little bit on how you were able to actually make this abstraction. So and that that you actually allowed yourself to just um, completely ignore the monetary part, so that you um, um, were able to to get market feedback. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
I mean, for me, and I, and I don't want to, you know, paint this picture of woe is me or anything like that, but just knowing the kind of catalyst that got me into this world um, was, you know, I had lost my job and it wasn't even like I was responsible for it. There was a freak fire um, at a place. I had to pick up pieces in my life um, that were even outside of like, so I, I shared a little bit earlier, like I was drinking. I mean, that's pretty consistent, like in the restaurant world. Um, but I was drinking, drinking pretty consistently and I was just unhealthy. And so I wanted to fix that part of my life. I wanted to find a new job. I wanted to explore this world of, of constant feedback of, of content writing. Um, so really like making a business out of it wasn't even a part of the equation for me. And I, I think again, like I wish there was a more tangible answer, um, as to like, you know, I, I thought about it this way and uh, I thought I could make this happen, but it was really, um, following, a, a a cookie crumb trail because it was just enjoyable. And then once I started to see feedback of audience building, it was like, okay, well now I'm going to research. How do I, how do I monetize? How do I turn this into a business? And, and really that was like through, uh, mentors, people that I found online and connected with. It was through books. It was through courses. All that, all that kind of stuff. So, that, so yeah, that, that's uh, that's pretty interesting. So, um, like, can you picture as a, a little bit of? Um, so you lost your job, and like, you know, especially when you're when you when you just lost your job, you just need a source of income. So, how can you? How did you allow I actually to tell yourself, well, I'm just going to play around with this content thing? Well, I, um, luckily, you know, the social systems that we have here in the States, I was able to go on unemployment. I wasn't on for that long. I, I needed to get to work. Um, there was, I don't know what kind of the defining moment was to change my, um, you know, like mission of being like, okay, let's monetize it. I do remember, and I don't think I'll ever forget my first sale. Um, so I had grown really quickly and I'm really big into solving puzzles and reverse engineering things. I kind of reverse engineered. My first ever product was an ebook reverse engineering my, um, uh, like the systems that I used to garner the type of online attention that I did. And it was May of 2018. It was all compiled in an ebook. Um, and it was May of 2018. Essentially, what I had was my first funnel, and it was created through a um, a welcome sequence email or a email welcome sequence. And I won't include his last name, but um, the individual who bought this first was his name was Daniel. And um, I remember my I got a Stripe notification. I was selling it for thirteen dollars and fifty cents. I don't even know why I chose that price point. Um, I thought it was like the right thing to do, and and now I do different testing and stuff like that. But um, I remember thinking like I had this wave of so many different emotions kind of um, flooding over me thinking like, okay, I'm going to be a millionaire by the end of the year. I figured out, like I cracked the code the rest of the year. I didn't sell a single, like one more product I made in 2018. I made just $13 and 50 cents. Um, but it was knowing and, and I'm kind of, uh, like on my Twitter, I say that, you know, um, my content is for all the quote unquote underdog writers who want to learn audience building in a world where entrepreneurship is the future, because I've always seen myself as an underdog. Um, like I shared in the beginning of this, I didn't go to school for writing. Um, I didn't, I was never like trained in any way. I never worked for a newspaper. I was never a journalist. And so I resonate a lot with overcoming imposter syndrome and proving both yourself and other people wrong. And it was like that moment of making your first sale kind of changed what I thought was possible. You know, like I'm, I, I see myself as this person who um, is always trying to defy the odds. And it was like, okay, I defined the odds. I did the hardest thing to do. And that's just getting your first dollar. After that, anything is possible. Um, so it was really that moment where I'm like, okay, now is going to be the 
the journey of turning this into a a full on um, enterprise and business. Yeah, so true. I mean, I've coached like over the past ten years. I mean, I've coached so like hundreds of people, and I always keep saying the same. What you just said, it's like the first sale. Actually, it's is is worth way more than um, mm -hmm. you know than than the amount of money that you're getting because it actually proves something. It actually sends a signal to your brain that another way is possible. A hundred percent. And it's, it's like, I think that there's a very sacred and um, profound ripple effect for people that answer the question, like, why not me? You know, I think like a lot of people have that question, why not me? Um, but then a lot of people stop just at like, well, because all, all these excuses, X, Y, and Z. And it's like, there's so much, like, I, I don't even think there's a human on the planet that can comprehend what the interconnectivity and the network effect of the internet allows, like the opportunities that it allows for. I have this like little joke um, uh, that I think connects uh, to this, but it's like, if you're um, on a productivity website looking for how to be more productive, you're working on the wrong thing, right? Like if you're constantly just reading self-improvement books to improve yourself without acting on the lessons you learn, you're working on the wrong project. And I think that like, like when I first put that and started marketing that product, it took a mm -hmm. while before I got a sale. But if I just stopped at the first attempt, I probably wouldn't be here talking to you, right? Like I think every first attempt is destined to fail. It's like a universal law. But yeah. what separates people is the people that try a second time and a third time and a fourth time. And I think that if people can wrap their heads around or, or at least entertain that they won't be able to comprehend the ripple effect to just try, um, you'll be surprised where you end up one year, three years, five years from, from trying that third, fourth, fifth time. Yeah. I, I mean, so many people are, are afraid of, actually failing right because failing hurts so how did you actually like have you like you you just mentioned that you you have been um struggling with imposter syndrome so how did you actually over like over like imposter syndrome it's not actually the fear of failure but like maybe we can link to it in in some way or another yeah um so i don't think that it you know i'm not a um like an alcoholic or anything like that. I have friends after working in restaurants, uh, I have a family member and, and they say it's a disease, right? Like you never um, cure yourself of addiction. Um, and I think imposter syndrome is almost similar to that. Like in January, when I started, even though I built this massive audience on Medium um, and I've been able to do these remarkable things for myself and my business, like I still had imposter syndrome going on this new platform. Um, so one tangible thing that actually helps me overcome imposter syndrome, and this may sound cheesy, but it works for me and I think it's going to work for a lot of other people, is turn off all notifications. Like I don't see, there's always going to be trolls. I don't see what the trolls say. I don't see when someone likes, comments, does anything on um, any of the platforms in which I produce content. And what that does is I'm trying to like reorganize my um, intent of publishing is focusing more on output than outcome. And notifications always remind you of the outcome. And so if you set these expectations for yourself and say, okay, I'm writing this thread or I'm writing this medium article and it needs to accomplish X, Y, and Z, I need a specific outcome. And then when that outcome isn't achieved, what does it do? Well, it makes you feel like an imposter. It's this, it's this positive feedback loop that just drives you into the ground. Um, and I think, again, it's a small change and it might, some people might bat an eye on it. To me, it's made a world of difference. It's just turn off all notifications. I even turned off, I borrowed from Tim Ferriss. I um, turned off notifications of like my email. 
I, I can't, even though it feels great to get a sale, you know, I get a Stripe notification or a PayPal notification mm-hmm. or, or something like that. And I make a sale, um, selling something. I don't want to know until I choose to look at my email. Um, so that to me, uh, hopefully it resonates with someone that that's a tangible change that I've made, um, during the course of my day that helps me overcome this expectation or the, this need to reach an expectation. Um, and when I don't, it makes me identify, self-identify as an imposter. Yeah, I mean, that made a, make a lot, a lot of sense. And like to everyone who's who's doubting about what you just said, like I would just invite you just like, you know, if you're on your smartphone, just try to delete the social media apps and try to delete your email app. If you see just like, you know, a tiny a tiny second of, fr- of friction, that means that, well, you should give it a try for at least for the next seven days and then just see what, what actually happens. 100%. Yeah. So uh, this is pretty interesting. And, and you know, <clears throat> I have like a, a course where I'm talking about where I'm helping people overcome information overload. And one of the tips I gave him, I gave him at the course is just, you know, sometimes we are just like too much into information because we just have like... Um, we just have to lower down our our boredom threshold, right? So today it's so easy to get stimulated by by all these apps and by everything. So you know, doing yourself a favor and try to lower your boredom threshold would actually help you to um, uh, think better, think like, and actually just do the work that you have to do. Because like, um, if I just take the example of the last thread that you that you published. Um, uh, like uh, yesterday, by the time of this recording, um, I mean, you just see the thread that got like uh, four thousand likes and uh, eight hundred retweets and all the all the stuff. But where are the other? I don't know, maybe five hundred tweets or one thousand tweets that you published before that. So um, until you achieve like the the quote unquote big success or um, like the thing that that you're that you're looking for, you just have to do like the steps every day. And if you can actually manage um, your attention, if you can not actually uh, get rid of all those notifications, which I think are the devil. Like I may be very biased uh, regarding that, but I mean that's just my opinion. Then you're not able to actually um, put one step in 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 front of the other. Yeah, I'm I'm glad we're on the same page. There's a um there's a, a a guy, a marketer that I mean I've read like four of his books. Um Seth Godin, if uh you and anyone listening is familiar with him, he has to me it's a it's a very profound quote that uh, I keep at my the front of my mind when I'm creating work. So like just to kind of um, repeat what you just said. Yeah. Yesterday I had a thread go live. It's at like 750,000 views and it's helped me with my funnels and, and generate a bunch of email subscribers. Um, uh, That's great. But today I published another one and it's absolutely flopping. So Seth Godin has this quote um, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's like, it's a statistical truth that most of your work will be average but you need to go through that to have the highs. And of course you're going to have the lows, but I think a lot of beginners um, and myself included when I was beginning and even still today, sometimes um, you, you work so hard on your content and maybe you edit it a bunch of times and you publish it and it doesn't do well. And then you you fall into this this cycle of like, well, I'm not good enough, or the audience doesn't get me. Or you you make up all these things, and it's like, well, that's not the truth. Part of the truth is, statistically speaking, you can't have all bangers. You can't have all viral content. That's not how mathematics works. You know, like averages exist because it's a statistical truth. And I think when you kind of like remember that. Where it's like, okay, it's not the outcome. It's not about having things be successful. What it's about is the practice. What a, what it's about is the output. And so, can you can you organize and create systems in your day and habits in your day that allow you just to produce content towards audience building, towards monetization, towards funnels, 
um, regardless of the outcome. And when you have a great outcome, like amazing kudos, but that's not the goal. The goal is to create consistent systems. Um, and that quote from him was really just uh, kind of game changing for me. Yep, totally agree. So walk us a little bit more behind what systems are you actually using or in order just to to get things done? Yeah. Um, so are you looking more for like content systems? Are you looking more for monetization systems? I'm, I'm sure we can we can talk a little bit about both if you'd like, but where would you like to go first? Yeah, true. So 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 I mean like the, the first thing that um I would like to tackle is um if we go back um to your quote unquote Quora days, what happens is that you just saw um well it's possible to create um a viral piece of content. So um what did you do after that in order just to you know start getting your first sale and then um you know we can just take it from there. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of understanding um, the marketing and like the funnel side of online digital content, the first mentor that came into my environment was a guy named Benjamin Hardy. He's a PhD in psychology and he's really like a self-help guru because that's kind of what I was focused on. But he also had expertise in the marketing side. So I bought one of his courses years and years ago and um, learned just kind of the basic blueprint of a an email funnel. Now, in order to um, generate traffic, um, it's funny, I, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a uh, an art teacher and he wants to take his stuff online and he he bought like Sam Cart and he's like, oh, I'm learning about how to create sales pages and stuff like that. And I was chuckling a little bit. I'm like, how do they uh, teach you traffic? He's like, oh, you just buy YouTube or uh, Facebook ads. And I'm, I'm Easy, laughing right? because I've, I've done like <laughs> Facebook ads. And it's not just as simple as you buy ads. Like there is years of understanding, you know, uh, copywriting and design and messaging and funnels. But anyway, um, I just like how those SaaS products kind of wipe their hands clean of the whole traffic. Um, so I knew I had to get eyeballs on my content to sell these new products that I was creating. And so my content schedule with, um, Quora at the time was, um, it w- when I was working in a restaurant, I needed to be at the restaurant at the latest, uh, three 30 in the afternoon. Cause it was, um, you know, dinner service. So I would wake up and I would write two anywhere from 750 to a thousand word answers to questions I was confident I could answer on Quora. And I became pretty obsessed. Like it was a lot of writing minimum five days a week. And it was really just, okay, I want to create a habit of publishing. I believe this habit will, um, like this practice will increase my skill overall as a writer. And all of this content is going to provide feedback. So for about a year, it was it was all just slam content as much as I can into the world. Um, and that allowed me to create organic traffic. And then that led to like A-B testing and stuff like that. But um, so that really just carried on even to the other platforms. Um, Medium, I think the quality of content on Medium needs to be a little bit more robust than Quora. Um, so it wasn't two articles. It was just one, um, a day for a very long time. And now on, on medium, I'm at one or two articles a week because I have, you know, only so much bandwidth in the day and my focus, uh, audience building focus right now is, is Twitter. Um, and Twitter it's one thread article a day at about five days a week. Um, I'm trying to push it to six days a week. Um, and that's going to scale back, but, um, I need to just collect data um, uh, tremendously right now. So, um, really I think, you know, if I could give a takeaway to someone listening who wants to get into this world, I think that like quantity to start and people will kind of argue like, Oh no, you need quality. But if you're an underdog writer like me, you know, teaching yourself to write, like you have to be comfortable with your first, you know, hundred articles being crap. You have to be okay with that 
that's part of the growing process in any area of life that you find yourself in, that you're going to be bad until you practice and get better. Um, so the more content, the more quantity you can put out into the world, um, it will, if you're, you know, reading things and studying things, learning from others, reverse engineering things like it will get better and you can start to scale down, um, your, your output. Um, but in terms of my systems, it was, you know, at a certain time, you know, years ago, it was about 11 o'clock to about two o'clock. I was just churning out at minimum two answers a day that turned into one article a day on medium. And now it's, uh, I, I have full time, so I can do a thread a day minimum and I schedule out now, but a thread a day minimum on Twitter. If you enjoyed this episode so far, can I ask you for a quick favor that will not take more than 10 seconds out of your valuable time? If you're an iPhone user, please head over to iTunes. I've just included a direct link to the podcast so that you don't have to search for it. Simply click the link and just tap and give this show a five-star review. This will help me get more exposure so that I can feature and convince more guests to come on the show to share more valuable knowledge with us. And if you're on YouTube, simply hit the like button. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And now let's go back. Yeah. I mean, if you really, if, if you really think about it, like you, like, uh, you know, so many people think that, you know, the success, like just, you know, you just wake up and with a bunch of followers or with, with a, with a bunch of, of, of sales or, you know, success just, you know, you know, will be in front of your door. But the thing is like, you have been publishing, um, on Quora for one year, just answering questions for free. I mean, if you really think about it, um, like it's, it's just mind blowing. Yeah. I mean, luckily our brain is hi- hardwired to, uh, you know, to become addicted to dopamine. And when you get like, you know, when you see numbers and stuff like that, like it creates mm. this addictive feeling to be like, okay, some more, some more, like let's, let's keep doing yeah. this. Um, and again, I think that there are the people way smarter than me that understand. I just had a, a phone call. Um, what was it last week, two weeks ago uh, with this guy that wanted some insight on medium. Um, but he just recently sold like his seven figure, advertising agency like he used to work on wall street and um so there, there's people that are way smarter than me that would use a different model mm-hmm. my model that i'm able to encourage people is the side hustling model of like you're not going to have what you want you know um, through investment fundraising have a business plan stuff like that like it's really following an interest listening for feedback seeing the cues, double downing on what works or doubling down on what works and then repurposing and iterating as you go. And then just yeah. keep, you know, it's like a snowball. Um, so that's the model I kind of subscribe to. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that's very interesting. And, and before going like deeper down, um, like how you like build your, your funnels, I just wanted to share like something here is like, um, I've started, um, a uh, new YouTube channel. This was like, I guess, w- at the beginning of 2021. Okay, and the thing is, like, um, I've published on 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 the channel. I guess five five days per per week, something like that. So I was or six days per week. I mean, I just allowed my lazy self, I guess, one or two days off, and I was like publishing a, a video. Um, I, I I published tw- 91 videos. Okay, and if you think about it, 91 videos and let the like a few days ago i just made the the calculations and only 12 of them got more than 1000 views which means that statistically if i didn't mess up with the with with the stats here it's only about less than 8% of videos that go that got more than 1000 views and the thing is you know what after 91 videos i stopped why because i just i didn't just enjoy the process you see what I mean? So sometimes creating also a bunch of, uh, you know, a, a bunch of content at the beginning that is not perfect. First, it allows you to suck uh, in silence, so nobody will throw mm-hmm. stones at you because like nobody, you you won't get any traction. But on the flip side, you'll also know more about which kind of medium do you actually enjoy, and like ju- just this alone is 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 one of the the greatest lessons that that you can actually. Uh, that you can actually learn because 
if you know exactly the things that you enjoy and the things that you don't, well, then you can dub- double down on the things that you enjoy. But if you don't know, if you're just looking for um, outside advice for people telling you, well, you should go on Twitter or well, you should start a YouTube channel or well, you go show, you should go on TikTok and uh, you know dance for three minutes. Well, um, <laughs> I mean, all this advice is, is nice, but at the end, what do you enjoy? So, yeah, yeah, I think there's a um, there's a uh, oh, I forget the polling publication, uh, but I wrote an article like six months ago. And it had to do with just dissatisfaction in the workplace. And it's like 33% of Americans in this poll are thoroughly dissatisfied with their job. And it's like people automatically think, okay, well, if I'm the boss, if I'm in control of my destiny, then I'm automatically going to be happy. And it's like, no, even if you can find yourself being the boss, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're that you found something that's fulfilling. So I like what you just yeah. said there Matt of you know I was doing this whole YouTube thing and I saw cues that were like okay this is maybe what's working I was getting data and feedback but it was still like but I'm not enjoying it. So at least I put in the time to figure out well that's not for me. Um and and I think that you know kind of this again uh, mode of doing things allows you to see that because it's not always just sunshine and rainbows on the other, you know, on the other side of the the grass. When you're in the one who's in control, you can still be pretty miserable. Yeah, exactly, and especially if you just take, you know, any advice you get online for granted, then you just think, well, this is the only way to go. And you know, this is this is this is the issue that we have today when it comes to the quote unquote making money online world is like you know everyone is like just so biased and they're just preaching their methods they're preaching their frameworks as as is as this was just like the only truth right um because this is actually what marketing is it's like you just want to polarize and you just want to uh disqualify all the other solutions but i mean it's just persuasion right if you like if you really want like if you really start to use your brain a little bit you just see that well People are succeeding on TikTok. People are succeeding on LinkedIn. People are still succeeding at, uh, on SEO. I mean, if you prefer the SEO game and and don't want to dance on TikTok, then well, then just do the SEO game. You see what I mean? So it's mm-hmm. it's really all about, uh, you know, like you know that like the. I'm sorry if I go a bit little bit too emotional because no, like, I'm loving this. I, yeah, because it's it's it's. I mean, it it hurts so many people because when when people just you know buy on one specific methodology or they just buy on what worked for someone else doesn't mean that it will work for you. Yeah. And I think too, that, you know, speaking to people that are, cause I spent a lot of money over the course of my career on courses and stuff. And I think it's very important. Um, you know, there, there's some bad courses out there. There's some really great courses out there, but even the really great courses out there or coaching out there is to not follow every instruction to a T. It's more to see, okay, what are the the underlying foundations? What are the frameworks? How do I take those and mix it with my own processes, personality, mission, um, abilities, skills, to make it something that A, I can sustain over the long term and B, create something packageable for an audience. I think too many people, and, and I don't blame them because like, you know, and not to get too overarching, but it's like, look at our school systems. Our school systems are built in a way of, you know, this is the content. It's either right or wrong. You regurgitate it on a test and you're given a score. And then when you try to, to venture into this entrepreneurial world, it's, well, this was the framework I was given when I was a kid is that there's a right and wrong way and I will be graded as such as a feedback to know, am I closer to the right way or closer to the wrong way? Whereas in the entrepreneurial world, there are days I wake up and I'm trying to take on a new project. I have no idea what the hell I'm doing, but it's understanding, okay, what foundations can I rely on? Can I fall back on to be you know, a guiding light into figuring out how to solve this problem I'm working on? Um, so it's like two conflicting ideologies that are hard to remedy sometimes. Um, 
when you're just starting out, even if you're experienced, you know, you've been doing this for 10 years, Matt, and I'm sure there's times where you can resonate with what I just said, where it's like, man, I'm taking on this new thing and I've re- I'm really treading on like shallow water trying to figure this out. Yeah. And, and especially, you know, especially like, you know, marketers know that and I, excuse me if I'm going like, you know, to spoil some of the money back guarantees, <laughs> especially if, if you have to follow the course step by step and prove me that, that you've applied every single step that I teach in the course in order just to get a refund. Well, then this makes the thing um, like, then you can just not really proceed and really mm-hmm. understand like what are the principles. And especially if you, if, if you take the, um, if you take in consideration that most online courses today, I'm not talking about every online course, but most online courses today, and especially the online courses that are successful, um, actually rely on tactics. They don't really teach you the big level thinking because, um, you know, may it be done on purpose or not, um, if, like, if you put, like, yourself into like the place of the guru the guru knows like all the different tactics even though he applies the same principle let's say if it's let's say on getting uh running ads on facebook or on 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 youtube i mean the underlying principles of persuasion of selling people what they want of actually crafting crafting a compelling message uh i mean they are pretty the same right the only thing that like that changes is the color of the button and what you mm-hmm. actually have to, have to test. So this is also like, um, and I like I'm te- I'm I'm talking about that because I have been in the same situation where um, I just thought, well, I can just outsource the hard part, which is thinking, and then just buy my success uh, through a course. Regarding your like, we went a little bit off track, but I think um, as long as um, we actually can uh, keep. A, a great conversation. Um, it doesn't really matter, and even if, if we go a little bit off track um, when it comes to the title of, of the show, um, I think that um, what we are like covering here are fundamental skills um, and fundamental habits that you have to develop if you really want to be to be successful. Maybe as a digital writer or just as an entrepreneur, right? Because we just talked about a lot of um, um, like quote unquote mindset and a and, and lot of uh, paradigm shifts that you really have to to embrace if you really want to be to be successful. So right now let's just shift gears a little bit and let's go back into the digital writing funnel. So mm-hmm. um, given the fact that you have a piece of content that performs well, um, what are the next steps? Yeah. So for me, where I would start is, um, really it's at like the headline. Um, I think a lot of people starting out, um, this is specifically, well, I guess it's not specifically to digital written content because you can apply it to YouTube. You can apply it to podcasts. You can apply it is digital content consumption from my um, point of view is all about Here's my promise, and this is kind of like marketing 101, but it's here's my promise. By taking a chance on it, I'm going to deliver that promise to you. And so when I was learning, it was what are the patterns that work in the realm of headlines? And the two biggest ones are how to and its lists, because how to says, I'm going to help you solve this problem. You're laying it out there for them. Lists are saying, you are going to learn about this information in this amount of time. And now I know most lists don't say in this amount of time, but it's like, you know, 12 takeaways or three lessons, stuff like that. And those are patterns in digital content that work. So if when I was figuring out, okay, how do you make content work? It was, well, your number one job is to get someone to click on your content. And how do you do that? You be as clear, concise, and actionable as possible in your promise. And promise is just another name for headlines. So um, I started reading other writers. I started creating like swipe files of like, okay, well, this, you know, why did I click on this article? Um, And I would save them in, you know, 
my Google Drive, stuff like that, and started to just look for different patterns. And really, there's plenty of different like um, headline templates one can use. For me, I just think like, you know, do the number one and number two uh, proven frameworks. Um, so that'd be how to enlist, but um, you could go deeper into that. Um, but I think for beginners starting out, you know, don't, uh, don't overcomplicate things and, and just start there. Yeah. I mean, you were just talking about the how to pattern. Um, I remember Gary Halbert telling that, well, if you had, let's say a bad night or like you don't, you don't really don't know what to write about, then just start with how to, um, how to is actually the hardest. It's actually quite hard to outbeat the how to headline. So the safest bet is always start with how to. So yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I would start there. And even, even that, um, like I, I have uh, coaching that I give for people's articles and stuff like that. And people, I think one of the biggest hurdles when you're trying to perfect uh, or at least uh, increase your skill in headline writing is you will say how to, but then the rest of it is very confused. Well, it's not confusing for you, but it's confusing for the reader. So a kind of um, lesson that I give or um, education that I give is instead of how to blank, use the framework, how any, and then you fill in like an avatar. So it'll be like college student can blank, like um, it's solve a problem. And then if you really wanted to get more specific, it would be in blank amount of time. So it would be like how any college student can um, write 100 articles in under a week. And I mean, that's that, that headline needs a lot of work. I'm just making it up on the spot. But yeah. that way you're being as specific of who are you talking to, which is a very important question that every single reader of your content will ask, is this talking to me? So you answer, who are you talking to? You're answering the question, what is this about? And it's about writing 100 articles. Okay. And why should I read it? It's the last question that a reader asks. Why you should read it? Because I'm going to teach you all of that, how to do it in under a week. Because if you don't have that framework in front of you, like I have a, a template that I use to write articles and it's really just like an outline and I fill in the blanket at the top um, of my headline section, I have, did you answer who is this for? Did you answer what is it about? And did you answer why should the reader uh, read it? And if I can't answer those questions, it's time to you know do another revision of the headline. Um, so that was the framework that I kind of give my students because it it really like it's like training wheels into writing a how to article. And then once you get more comfortable, you can say how to blank um, and be more specific. Because sometimes a lot of people are like how to live a better life and mm -hmm. uh, achieve what you want. And it's like, well, what does that even mean? What does what does a better life mean? What if what I want mm -hmm. is different than what you want? You're not being specific enough. So um, th that that would be my um, my little gift there. Great. I like uh, it's awesome. I mean, simple questions, but if you apply them to every headline that you that you're that you're writing, um, I mean, you're going to sharpen your writing skills um, way faster than just like you know coming up with a headline and then just publishing it. So sometimes, um, not sometimes. I mean, the headlines it, it, the headline is eighty percent of the of the work. So what comes after that? So what comes after that is. Um it would be really, it's the intro. Like if you've read Ga Gary Halbert, um, maybe you've read Joseph Sugarman too. And mm -hmm. Joseph Sugarman, who's another legendary um, uh, advertiser, is, uh, like asks a question in one of his books. He goes, what's the number one job of the headline? And the number one job of the headline is to get the reader to read the first sentence. What's the job of the first sentence? to get the reader to read the second sentence and what's the job of the second sentence, third sentence and so on. So the next thing that I would do is work on your very first sentence in an article, make a statement, pick a side, ask a question, give a statistic, do something that grabs a reader's attention. Because now that you've got them to click on your promise, they've taken a chance on you very quickly can you lose that chance. And that's where the whole conversation of like clickbait comes into play. 
Like I've seen wild, crazy, outlandish promise headlines that I click and they immediately start to go into something that's not that. That's when I tag it as clickbait. But if you give me a wild and crazy headline, I click on it and within a second, you like make a declarative statement about that headline that gets me hooked and I read the rest of the content and I think, oh, they actually delivered on that promise. There's no way in that I can call it uh, clickbait. So True. the next thing is, um, and it takes a lot of kind of like practice and copy, but it's it's work on that first sentence. Awesome. And then what like um, what does the process look like after that? So the process that looks like after that, specifically with online digital content, is I think a lot of people don't, uh, a lot of beginners, I would say, don't put an emphasis on design of a content. And what I mean by that is um, if you were to read a book, um, a lot of the content has kind of, you know, like the, the rule you learn in high school is a paragraph must be a minimum three to five sentences and you group different thoughts and paragraphs. And when you go on to a new thought, it's a new paragraph. Digital writing is not like that at all. Sometimes a paragraph is just one sentence. Sometimes a paragraph is just one word. People online don't read content. They skim content. And so what that calls for, at least through what I've learned, is you have to design the reading experience of the content in front of you. And so that includes having subheadings, of being, I see subheadings as checkpoints for a reader's eye because they're not going to read. If you write a thousand words, they're probably going to read 300 of those words. They're going to be like, think about how fast people scroll through social media. And if you're on medium, you know, there's thousands of articles competing for their attention. Um, you need to at least give them digestible, um, takeaways. And I see that that's what like, um, subheadings are for. You want to send them down the page. Another term that Joseph Sugarman uses is called the slippery slope. And if you're not, if you're doing kind of the traditional model of writing, and that's like big, bulky paragraphs, people are going to gloss over. They're not going to want to read and invest that much time when they're on a social media platform. They're going to click away and go to the next article. So that means breaking up your sections using white space. Um, and this isn't taking away, like you actually have to have good content in there, good readable content. Don't, don't put garbage in there, but um, learn how to design uh, digital content. And there's, there's plenty of resources. I have resources. There's plenty of resources out there that will educate you on designing the content that the reader is going to read. Yeah. I mean, uh, like design impacts, like it's really like working on the environment, right? If you don't make... Th um, things appealing um uh, i mean then people will not consume your content right so it's really all about working like getting the editing the formatting right and really make it easy as as uh, as you mentioned just for people to skim through the article because what happens is that you really have to think about your content as you know um as a kind of a cannon on the on a on a on a, on a grocery shelf, right? Like, I mean, you have so many cans that people can can pick can pick up. Like, why should they invest more time in your like taking your can or like spending more time on your on your piece of content if you have thousands and and, and, and thousands of other uh, content like just competing for their attention? So you really have to do the job in in actually grabbing the people' attention. So what are you doing like after that? Look. I really want you to to walk me a little bit more down the funnel. So what happens after you um, actually created a piece of content that actually grabbed the attention? So how actually do you turn, um, let's say, free content, um, maybe a tweet, maybe an article, maybe something else, into actually money into your, in, in your bank account? Like, yep, obviously, good like question. The, the, so, you know. um, I piece of content that you put out into the world. Um, and as a, you know, a, a starting beginner, maybe this is a steep learning curve, but every single content should have an invitation for further exploration into your world. And what I mean by your world is your world, the creator. So for me, and a lot of this started on Quora first, it was to include article footers, um, that are calls to action 
for the reader. And the simple framework that I use is want, and then you know you fill in um, a benefit or a solution to your niche related problem. So it's um, if you're a dog trainer or, or, or you're trying to learn how to um, train your dog from home without hiring someone and you're just reading content, it would be like, um, want your dog to listen to every command. Well, then check out my, I use freebies. Some people use just newsletters, but I find that the conversions of like free guides, free mini courses, stuff like that work better, even though it does have generally a higher higher unsubscribe rate because people just get the freebie and then unsubscribe off. My email list still grows uh, very consistently. Um, I exchange a freebie in uh, exchange for the person's email address. When they get that PDF guide, it's sent immediately to their email address. This is kind of like um, email footers and landing page 101, but they are then enrolled in my welcome sequence email. Right now, and I've had it for a couple of years, it's an 11 day um, email sequence email, email sequence email, email sequence um, that takes them through kind of starting at zero and giving them a crash course onto the strategies that I would, um, you know, uh, implement if I were in their shoes, kind of, of audience building 101. I'm going to be changing that very soon to a five day email sequence. I feel like 11 days is just way too long. And, um, and at the end of that email sequence, um, with a lot of different positioning and framing, copywriting, I then position a product at a discounted rate. So that's the first um, product. Uh, oh, no, that's not the first. Excuse me. That's the second offer that they get. The first offer is recently I've included a um, tripwire is what it's called. So if people that really want to take action, I um, because they're members of now I call it the tribe since my business is tribe loyal. Um they get a special discount at, at my introductory product. Um, so that uh, brings in uh, revenue for me. And then at the end of the welcome sequence, they get a um, pitch for a different product. And so that's my automation in terms of sales. And then I run different campaigns that we can we can dive into. But in terms of automation, that's that's the basic framework. Okay, great. And how do you actually approach... Let's say, um, like you, you may have like articles about um, different subjects. So, do you create, let's say, a, a specific welcome series or a specific, um, you know, kind of on like email course or just a freebie related to that specific topic, or do you like do you just have like one standard welcome series, and the only thing that changes is actually the the freebie that you deliver? So I used to, I used to have a lot of different segments in my email list. And that to me became, because I'm just a, you know, a a business of one. um, Yeah. That became just overwhelming for me. And a a lot of why I do what I do um, comes into bandwidth. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, I don't want this thing to take over my life. Um, So now I just have one welcome sequence and my, um, Offering my freebie is kind of from 35,000 feet. You know, it's more of an overarching um, solution to a problem rather than extremely like niche specific to the article. Okay. um, Which allows me again to kind of have more of a streamlined process. It's probably, you know, I won't lie to you, it it probably does um, take away from different opportunities that I could definitely magnify. But, uh, you know, a lot of what I do has to do with the fulfillment of my life and not just dollar signs. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all about, you know, the cost of opportunity, of course, like mm-hmm. you could optimize so many things, but like, is it really worth to optimize for the 3.26% and then like, you know, just eating up two hours of your day? Like, this is like a question that as a, I can I don't know if I can say a repented perfectionist because I'm still a perfectionist, but um, I mean, this is like just something that you have to keep in mind, right? Like you want to make things right, like let's just make them like to the 80, 20, right? Right. Don't try to, to overcomplicate things. <laughs> For sure. And then I think, 
you know, um, I'm always iterating and running A-B tests and things like that because I don't think that there's ever a, like a final destination for anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but really like my A-B tests aren't testing, you know, it's freebie A versus uh, freebie B. It's testing headline A versus headline B, stuff like that. So, Okay, makes sense. So, you know, we have like the hot thing right now is LinkedIn, Twitter, Like, what about Medium? Is Medium dead? So can you walk us a little bit about, like, based on your experience, like, if I was a new writer or um, not specifically a new writer, but someone who just wants to build um, an audience, who wants to build an email list, who wants just to get his first subscribers, what would you actually suggest doing? Yes, that's a great question. So it used to be start on medium. And the biggest reason for that was because you can monetize right away. Mm -hmm. Um, You can't anymore. And medium is far from dead. I do want to uh, um, at least make that clear. Um, But certain changes were made, like you need a follower requirement to monetize. And I think in the entrepreneurial world, monetization through content views isn't as a valuable lesson as monetization through marketing and sales of a proprietary product. Yep. Um, so what I would do if I was starting out is I would start on Twitter because I think you can get not just audience growth, but I think you can get data feedback the fastest. And I think if you wanted to take digital writing seriously It is not as much about the written content as it is about understanding and analyzing of the data. And you can get that very, very quickly on Twitter. Plus, I think to be a good writer on Twitter is a lot harder than being a good writer on more of a long form content platform like Medium, because you only have, even though you can do threads, You only have the 280 character space to um, package a concise, direct, and compelling message. And that takes a lot of skill. So you'll learn how to write clearly quicker than having no like character limit, you know, and writing a 2,500 word article on Medium that doesn't get read by anyone. And now you have no data to um, kind of iterate, repurpose, uh, things like that. So what I would do is, you know, even if I were to give you, and we talked about how the tactics probably aren't the best mode of education, but I would say spend six months on Twitter, create lists of people that you um, aspire to and want to learn from and only isolate, create an echo chamber. I know that's kind of like a taboo word, Mm -hmm. but we're, you know, creating positive things for the world, not just finger pointing echo chamber stuff. I would create an echo chamber of like, if you're in the um, copywriting niche, I would find all the copywriters that are on the platform, create a list of them, only interact with their content. Um, And you know, something that I I recently, um, this idea that I had, if you're familiar with like hip hop culture in a way, Mm -hmm. I really admire hip hop culture and I'm applying it to writing in the sense of a lot of rap and hip hop songs sample like beats from other songs. So for instance, um, what's like a really, I won't give an example of a song, but a lot of times when you hear like a hip hop song, the beat is sampled from like a song from the seventies or something Mm -hmm. like that. And I think a lot of people in the online writing space are afraid of, and I don't condone it at all, are afraid of plagiarism if they borrow an idea from another writer, I think borrowing ideas is a way of learning. Plagiarism is clearly wrong. And in the hip hop world, you will have a hip hop artist that will sample the beat of an artist who came before them and then make that song their own. And I think that that is a, a kind of a good metaphor for trying to gather data in the online writing world. And you can do that with Twitter. You look at, okay, what did this person who has a large audience write? How can I take the fundamentals of that 
make it my own and publish it as a tweet or publish it as a thread and then get the data behind it. Um, you don't need to reinvent the world. And again, the speed of Twitter allows you to get that data very quickly. And then once you have a handle on that and you start to see consistent growth, what I would do is move to medium because after your first hundred followers, you can monetize and monetization always feels good. And you can get, uh, you know, start practicing longer form content writing because I think longer form content writing, I've had loads of freelance um, clients that came to me. I've never once done outbound outreach to try to sell my freelance services. And it comes from medium because, you know, that's a portfolio of long form content that people say, oh, I want this kind of stuff for my my business or I'm a real estate agent. I want this kind of stuff for, um, you know, my work and stuff like that. Um, and that's more longer, longer term stuff. But if I were starting today and I was looking for advice um, uh, and I was listening to this podcast, uh, that's how I would do it. Interesting. So um, you like you create an echo chamber only with quote unquote the big players uh, that you want to follow. Um, how about interaction with with let's say um, other creators? How about because like I quote unquote try to reverse engineer some of your um, best performing threads, and I saw that you know. In a lot of them, you are actually quoting um, or like giving an example with a tweet where you're just like, I don't know if it's the right terminology, but you were like quoting the the tweet of, of someone else. And then, you know, so like they are getting um, a notification that, well, um, John talked about me and then let's just see. And, you know, you may, you may, you, you, you make them look smart because you just, um, uh isolated one uh, one thing that they've done pretty well so um how do you you approach that on a tactical side yeah i'm so glad you picked up on that matt because um i do think even though what i learned very quickly is even though i have this huge audience of 20,000 people on medium and you know so many people know me on the platform when i came to twitter i was virtually unknown. No one knows about my credential. No one knows about my history. No one knows about the skills that I can offer an audience. And so I could write from a place of authority and say, this is what you should do. And people don't care because yeah. I don't have any credibility on the platform. And so what you just described is I'm borrowing credibility from other people to still teach my audience something new. And I think that that is a very effective way uh, first, like you said, I make these people sound like they're geniuses, and a lot of them I believe are. But I, you know, it's free marketing for them. So they like it, and there's a chance that they can retweet it to their audience of 100,000 people. Okay. It's definitely part of the strategy. But it's also like being humble enough on the platform to say, you don't know me, I haven't earned your respect, and I don't have credibility. So let me borrow credibility from other people to still teach the lesson that I want to teach you. Um, I found that that strategy of using, you know, the the um, the work of other people um, as a very effective audience building technique, especially on um, Twitter. And you see this on Medium too, where someone will be like, "These are, um, you know, the ten productivity." Um, hacks recommended by Elon Musk, which I'm tired of those articles, but people still borrow the credibility of Elon Musk to talk about productivity, right? It's the same thing, but uh, Twitter has the network effect. Yeah. So this is exactly like, this is like also one of the main, the, the main, uh, um, the main ideas that I also put in, in my, you know, in my note taking and personal knowledge management thing is that you know, um, I try to distill the brightest minds in specific topics, right? And what I do if I tomorrow I have to sell a course, if tomorrow I have to create a piece of content, well, um, I can just borrow credibility from from these minds, right? So let's say tomorrow you want to demonstrate. So, like as an example, this morning I was like, I was like writing an, an email sequence, right? And I was about emphasizing about, um, you know, the importance of big ideas, right? 
And, you know, like in with my note-taking, um, I just came across tiny little bits of information. So that actually start um, emerge and start create a big cluster in my note-taking. So if I go back, let's say I have David Ogilvy talking about like the 80-20 of uh, like, he didn't put it like that, but actually he was just talking about that advertising actually is all about the big idea. Well, then came another another piece of content. I guess it was it was in the Baron letters from Gary Halbert, where he's just saying that well, it's all started with a, with a big idea. Like you, you only need one big idea to and, and execute on in order to, to to change your life. So if right now I'm coming up with a new product where I'm going to teach, let's say, entrepreneurs or content creators how to come up with better ideas. Well, it's not Matt Giaro, the, the unknown guy who's talking about that, right? No, no, I didn't make up anything by myself. If you go back to the legendary advertisers, they are telling by themselves that the idea is the main thing in all your marketing um, um, in, in all your marketing materials, same goes for let's say copywriting. You know, so many people focus on copywriting, but what I've learned from the greatest copywriters is that copywriter is copywriting is just like the twenty percent of the equation. If you want to really get it right, like there is like I don't know if you heard about it, it's the forty forty twenty rule, which states that like in every every sales message, like you have forty percent the audience, forty percent the offer, and only twenty percent the copywriting. So. Actually, people who just focus on copywriting don't focus on how to craft a great offer and actually don't put it in front of the right audience. They are basically multiplying something by zero and anything you multiply by zero just gives you zero, right? So mm -hmm. this is like, it, it told like, excuse me, like I went a little bit off track here, but it's really how to illustrate the strategy that you're using on, 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 on Twitter. Like these are one of like, these are really like the, the principles that you can apply, like may it be on Twitter, may it be on, on, on any kind of platform that you want. And these are actually the, the core concepts. And once you master just the concept, like you can apply it to any platform that you want. Will you even look at um, like traditional book publishing and writing? You know, uh, just two books that came into my mind as we're talking about this is like, Ryan Holiday is known for stoicism, right? Mm -hmm. But he's really just the messenger. He borrowed the ideas from Marcus Aurelius. He borrowed mm -hmm. the ideas from Seneca. He borrowed the ideas of Epictetus. And then you look at his mentor, Robert Greene, and one of like, you know, the highest selling books of all time, The 48 Laws of Power, mm -hmm. is he borrowed the ideas from Spinoza and from all like Lao Tzu and all these people. And it's like that every single person that you aspire to. CEOs, writers, artists, whatever, they all started at zero and they had to use the people that came before them yep. to illustrate their ideas. And I think if you're humble enough to, to not need to, you, the writer are irrelevant. You know what I mean? As long as you can give the content to the reader, they'll love you for it. And if you need to stand behind the Titans that came before you, do it, or if you're humble enough, do it because that's the way to really get noticed. Thank you very much, John. Um, anything you want to to add before um, we just uh, hang up the call? Well, of course, I'm going to give a shameless plug. Um, everything that we've talked about here um, and more, you can learn at um, all my socials, Twitter, Medium in particular, my website, tribeloyal.com. Um, you'll find my email on there. If anyone wants to shoot me an email and has questions, my, uh, my emails are open. And I would, I just, I think, you know, going back to more of kind of the overarching things we talked about, I really think that a lot of people don't give themselves enough credit for their ideas and for their goals and dreams. And I do think that you know, giving it a second, third, fourth, fifth try um, has ripple effects that, you know, if you're just consistent, can lead you to a place that uh, you never quite um, maybe thought was possible. And I would just keep following that and, and really want to hammer that message home. Awesome. Thank you very much, John. It was a pleasure to have you on the show. Pleasure was all mine. 
and uh, wishing you all the best thank you all right so i hope that you've enjoyed this episode with john brosio definitely there have been a lot of nuggets again that had been dropped so i hope that you took some notes so with that being said if you'd like to know more about what john is actually doing i left all the links in the show notes and if you actually enjoyed the little rants and the little things that i've dropped here um well you could get more you could get more on my newsletter so i have a private newsletter where i'm sharing like all the lessons i've learned along the years building multiple six-figure businesses online. I'm going to leave again all the links in the show notes. Thank you very much for tuning in. And yeah, I hope to see you next week with another great episode.